Hello! Welcome to Why Not Both. My name is Pam Schaefer, and I'm a musician and therapist in Los Angeles. Why Not Both is all about how our multiple passions inform our identity. And this season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar Magazine and produced by Laura Studeris. If you like what you hear, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and come spend time with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, and that is both on Instagram and on Twitter. This week, we got to talk to composer Oliver Arnolds all about his new album, Some Kind of Peace. Usually, we'd be hanging out at Iceland Airwaves in Reykjavik, but unfortunately, this year, we're all stuck at home. Thankfully, we have Ollie to keep us company. I hope you enjoy our chat. Welcome to Wine Above. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like who you are. Um, in honor of interviewing you while you're in while you're in Iceland, I did light some of the incense from Fisher in my living room. Oh, sweet. Yep. Very sweet. Yep. That's like they do right. smell very nice. Oh my god. I feel like a little like dragon hoarding it because um, I'm very far away now and can't just like readily buy more. But every time I light it, it feels like a really special occasion. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so how have you been during all of the um, shenanigans of 2020? Um, I mean, I do live in Iceland. It's not as hard here as uh, a lot of other places. And we're very fortunate for that. Um, but, but uh, at the same time, I'm kind of a sensitive one. <laughs> so uh, I often feel as the, the world is sitting on my shoulders through all of this. And I think in the, in the beginning, it was, it was pretty hard. Uh, but we all, you know, we find our pockets of where we feel safe and, and good, mm -hmm. you know, our little communities to hang around with. And I've just been concentrating a lot on, on music, actually, and, and, and kind of trying to see this all as an opportunity for transitions and change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because usually, at least I found when I was there that during the summer, usually people are out and about so much that then it's during the winter that I would imagine you would get more done. But like this time, it's like no one was out and about at all, really, for a while. Well, our summer here was actually COVID free. Um, so we were all out and about and <gasps> hugging and, and living a normal life for like four months, maybe uh, it before it came back. Um, so that was quite wonderful. We had we actually had a summer, summer. we traveled around and it was really special because we traveled around Iceland with no tourists. And <laughs> that was quite uh, quite unique to see all the uh, to go back to places that I haven't been to for like 10, 15 years because I wouldn't dare to go there because there's like a thousand people there and there's mm -hmm. nothing special about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you were going to like these famous tourist places like the geysers and stuff and be the only person there, which was quite... Oh, magical. wow. Yeah, what was that like, like rediscovering where you were? I think it, it's it's one of these good things that the pandemic can bring us. Is uh, I think we're used to we're used to um, always looking across the ocean for something to do. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side, and I think we've gotten kind of used to not seeing what's in our backyards. <laughs> and the <laughs> pandemic kind of forces us to it forces us to. Uh, to look a bit closer and rediscover what's around us. And I think that's a, that can be a really positive result of all of this. And hopefully that continues. We don't always need to fly half across the planet just to have a holiday. We can actually drive half an hour and find beautiful things. And, uh, Icelanders in general, I think, uh, have always felt really small. And we always have this need to go to see the big outside world, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this has taught us a lot about that. Um, yeah, so for, for me, it was quite special to, to go to some of these places that I, yeah, that I just wouldn't go to anymore because yeah. they're just not, 
that special when there's a thousand people there holding their selfie sticks and you know <laughs> <laughs> It's just weird. <laughs> that, that does take away from the natural beauty. I I remember my friend Maggie brought me to um oh gosh, it was like what I could best describe as a field of sulfuric, very hot water bubbling up from the earth. Um and close to the airport or close to Reykjavik? It was close to Reykjavik. It was um yeah. it was I believe on the peninsula. But there was a sign that was just like, stay on the wood path. And I was just like, who would step off the wood path here? Like, literally, there's like... A lot of people do. <laughs> that was what he said, is he's just like... And there were there wasn't anyone there when I was there. So I was just like, he took me to apparently a very obscure one. But it was like, I was like, people do that? And he's like, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> yeah. it's like, no, oh, it's sad. God. Like, it's so, so many of these because tourism happened so fast here that the infrastructure just wasn't quite ready mm. uh, so uh, we I think we didn't really think of of you know putting all these protections in place for our environment before we would have um, a couple of million people a year stepping on them so right. a lot of places uh, got kind of uh, trodden down if you can say that by yeah. By yeah. the amount of people just walking there you know they're not necessarily doing anything bad but just like when you have a million people walking somewhere you're gonna yeah. have new paths being created and the grass is gonna go away and it's, yeah. you know, you very quickly kind of ruin the natural beauty of the place the, the kind of untouched quality that right. draws people here in the first place right well yeah and that makes total sense that like even if people aren't say like going off the path you are certainly going to carve a path in something where there hadn't been a path prior yeah yeah and the, uh, often that you see these little paths slowly getting wider and wider and wider and until they look like a highway you know <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's just not a nice look <laughs> nope no nope, not what you're going for and also i mean the at least in my experience where i was driving like the foliage is so distinctive because you don't have like the large trees that i would imagine it would take a while for it to regrow because uh it's so funny. I was just like, I don't know if people listening know how incredibly windy it is in your country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things don't grow very fast. And a lot of our green is actually moss. It's not grass, it's moss. And moss mm-hmm. takes uh, over 100 years to regrow if you, oh, wow. if you pull it out. Yeah. I have renewed respect for the moss. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, not that I was like disrespecting the moss before, but I was like, I didn't know it took that long to grow. <laughs> yeah, because it grows, it grows directly on lava. It's growing on rocks. It's right. not growing on in soil. So it takes a very long time to grow. Huh. It's funny because I I do remember touching some of the moss there, but not with my feet. Like I was literally like I was on a roadside and I was like leaning over just to see what it felt like. Like I was very delicately poking at it. And it was such an interesting kind of like loamy texture, but I was very cognizant of like, don't step on it. I didn't know that it took a hundred years to regrow, but it just yeah. looked sort of like sacred in the way of like, this is for looking and maybe very delicate touching, but this is not for this is not for standing on. No, it's. I mean, it's okay if one person does it, but it's just if everyone does it, it's gonna get destroyed. So we kind of do it, but we tell everyone not to. <laughs> <laughs> we feel like it's it's our right to to enjoy the the softness of the moss. Like it's just one like laying down in moss in the summer is just amazing. It's like a soft bed. Oh but my gosh! Everyone who comes here, we tell them it's strictly forbidden to step on the moss. Forbidden. Yeah, not like moss angels. <laughs> That's really funny. And I would imagine like actually having that summer, did that inform any of the writing you've been doing this year? Because so many of us didn't really get the summer. Um, and also like, I don't know what your normal writing is like, like based on who you can collaborate with, what projects you're working on. Like, did that match your normal workflow or was that different for you? Um, so... I, most of the album was finished before summer, but it was not all finished before the pandemic. So I had written maybe half of it before the pandemic struck, and I did the other half during the first couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely, I, I wouldn't say it really changed the direction of the album, but as I was already kind of in this, 
I was already making an album that was way more introverted. It was all about like human connection and rituals and community and relationships. And uh, so the when the pandemic hit, it's, it was more kind of like confirming that direction. It was, mm. it was reinforcing that direction mm-hmm. rather than changing it. But then also it recontextualizes it, which I find quite interesting because without having created an album about COVID you know I don't don't really want to do that like it's not that interesting of a thing to write music about in in my opinion and which also it would probably just become very dated in a few years and nobody wants to listen to the COVID album in three years (laughs) (laughs) we'll be so glad when this is over that we'll never want to think of this time again but it's really interesting to see see it being recontextualized by by Mm -hmm. the pandemic and uh, you know, like the title, some kind of piece suddenly just fit perfectly, uh, and and it can be something that provides peace or a safe haven for people during these months, um, yeah, or or years, without having to be specifically written as a result of that. Well, yeah, that kind of that turning inward, but not in a way of excluding other people, but more like that deep that kind of turning inward for peacefulness and it it almost sounds like it mirrors like returning to the places that you hadn't been in like 10 to 15 years but you returned alone yeah i think i mean even though it wasn't maybe directly inspired by that it's definitely it that can definitely be a nice nice metaphor for what was happening yeah yeah so i was thinking of you know the effects of isolation that like even when you said earlier that you were like, and we got to hug our friends and I found myself blurting out, Oh my gosh, you got hugs. (laughs) (laughs) So I hug, I hug everybody now because I had COVID. So I'm like the hugger in my friend group. Oh my God. (laughs) I can, I can, I can safely (laughs) hug my friends. (laughs) What was your experience like with that? What happened? Um, It's, it's a bit shit. Like I, I, I didn't have it really bad um i had it much better than a lot of people do but um it definitely is not the nicest virus that i've encountered uh, it's very yeah. uncomfortable and it's also just with everything going on it's kind of a shock to be diagnosed with it yeah like, oh, oh like all everybody's talking about for the last half a year is suddenly you are a part of it <laughs> and, and that like just mentally that's it can be quite a shock yeah um, yeah but I'm 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 mostly worried about the kind of after symptoms, the post COVID symptoms that yeah. I've been experiencing, as a lot of people have. Even the people who've been symptomless, a lot of them experience like headaches or, you know, short term memory loss or lack of focus, and and that's that's happened to me, as well. Uh, the flu itself wasn't too bad. I've had worse flus. It was a pretty bad flu, but but afterwards I find like a very little tolerance for looking at computer screens for too long mm-hmm. I, you know I get headaches really easily if I exercise sometimes I totally crash you know I have no energy and mm-hmm. it's definitely getting better but it's been uh, it's been some time of where I've had to like be really careful and take it really easy Oof, I'm sorry you're experiencing that Oh, it's 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 all fine I don't you know, <laughs> complain <laughs> like I said I you know, I, I've had friends who got it and had it a lot worse than I did. So yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I get I get free hugs. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, especially, and that's interesting what you said about, you know, when I've had several friends test positive as well. And thankfully, like my friends have been okay, but have much like you've described. Um, it's a strange sensation to be like, oh, I'm part of that group now. Because. Yeah. It, it. I mean, did you then have to isolate for the 14 days? Like, at least here, it's like, it's so strange. I'd almost compare it to like, not like a sexually transmitted disease, but the same thing where it's like, there's this weird stigma of like, well, what did you do? And you're like, well, I was, I, I breathed. <laughs> like there was yes. some where I, I breathed in an inopportune moment. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> and I'm someone who has, who has always been careful. And by the way, I don't mean to, like, I was joking when I say I hug everybody. I know that's <laughs> actually not safe to do, even though I've had it. Because no, I know. Because can always be a spreader. So, I, 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 you know, I don't actually do that. <laughs> I, uh, but, I didn't anticipate that. Don't uh, worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, it's, you, 
you are as careful as you can be, but yet it can it can get you, you know. So that's kind yeah. of weird. Yeah, that sounds very surreal. The isolation was the was the strange part. I think the, mm-hmm. just being completely isolated because we never had a full lockdown here. So I think that was my first real experience of being locked inside my apartment for yeah a little over two weeks. I had to be. Oh my goodness. Life not seeing anyone not getting fresh air you know yeah i was gonna and, and at, at some point you start to feel like this this is also what's keeping you sick you know <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> you're not getting better because you can't go out and like touch the rain you know <laughs> yeah i was like do you at least have a patio do you have a balcony i do have a balcony yeah it's, i went on the balcony every day so, Ooh, okay uh, it's, so it's not the same i guess yeah one of i want to i like to feel the grass under my feet yeah that's i I feel for you that happened to some of my friends here where it's like we did have i mean we've had various stages of lockdown i would say um and various uh success or not (laughs) in regards to whether people were (laughs) following that (laughs) um but yeah that's been really my point of sanity and this is that i do have um like a little patio balcony and I think without that it would have been like oh that would have been really grim. I really feel for people who live in places like New York where the apartments are tiny yeah. and generally don't have balconies. Yeah because I think that you know like hearing about the theme of your album about turning inward there's a difference like turning inward when it's a choice versus turning inward when someone's like you're locked in your home now. Yes, but perhaps also uh, uh, an even even greater learning thing that can happen when it's not your choice. If you're just <laughs> staying at home because you want to stay at home, you're not actually learning anything from that. But if you if it is a challenge, if someone is forcing you to stay at home, you're you're kind of forced to look at things in your life yeah. that you that you maybe wouldn't do otherwise. So I, I don't. I, I'm just trying to find positive things and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, going through all that, I was like, yeah, definitely looking for where are the bright spots in this. I would be doing the exact same thing and have been doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Because I think about, especially with, you know, like looking kind of at your back catalog and looking at this, like you have done a lot of collaborations, but I would imagine that would be very different right now. And also you can't tour around your album. Yeah. Interestingly, a lot of collaborations are happening these days there it's almost like there's more than before i think Mm -hmm. especially at the beginning of the pandemic everybody was so kind of freaked out and people responded by trying to be hyper productive (laughs) yeah Uh, (laughs) which was a really interesting period like we're all locked at home now and we can't do anything so this is a great opportunity to make a lot of music Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. me myself included and i don't think i ever got so many collaboration requests as and and people contacting me for collaborations as, as in like a two or three week period until seemingly everyone suddenly realized that perhaps a, a devastating pandemic killing hundreds of thousands of people is, is not the best environment yeah. for, to be creative yeah. in. <laughs> and then it's somehow slowed down. Yep. Uh, yep. But yeah, collaborations are, are are, are I think really important these days and I am doing a lot of them and it's just sending files back and forth and, um, but obviously yeah no touring and um, I don't know when touring will happen again honestly because even if it becomes safe to be in a room with a few thousand people again then we we are kind of at risk of losing yeah. the infrastructure of our industry all the right. venues are closing down a lot of them permanently and yeah and also like the behind the scenes stuff like backline rentals mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. you know live industry companies like even the tour bus rentals they're all bankrupt now so when 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 we can tour again i think it will still take a while until we actually do because right who is going to support it and uh, yeah so i don't know when that's happening again so uh, but it's but it uh, again looking at the positive sides the, it, it's an opportunity for us to maybe question our ways uh, a little bit like i like to ask the question to myself nowadays like why do i tour 
Mm. Um, I, I do love touring, but it's just interesting to ask that question. Why am I doing it? And what is it that I'm missing from it right now? What is it that mm -hmm. can be replaced by some of the tools that we have? And, uh, or is there anything that can be replaced by them? Uh, and I've found kind of a couple of main things that um, I believe are the main reasons for why, at least me personally, I tour because it's it's the community aspect. Like music, it's a communal effort. Uh, a song is not a song unless there's someone listening listening to it because it that doesn't have any meaning until someone hears it. Like the meaning of the song gets created by your own interpretation of the song. Mm. Um, and live live music provides that environment for us to do that together as a community and feel the energy of the music together which mm -hmm. is super important and probably not something we can ever replace by anything else but live live shows are also an opportunity for us to tell the story of our music mm -hmm. um, in ways that we can't do with just a cover photo on the album or a social media post um, <clears throat> live live shows offer us an opportunity to stand on stage in front of thousands of people and actually tell them the story. <laughs> yeah, and there and tell we can tell anecdotes. I can tell stories about the song, and and even for artists who don't like to tell stories on stage, they they still are because people see them, they see their personality, and they sense their energy, and then yes. they 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 gain a a more deep understanding of what the music means or where it comes from. Um, and this part, I think we can work with. We we can we have opportunities to tell the stories of the music in, in other ways. So I'm kind of focusing on that part. That's really interesting to hear about how you view, like how one shares music. It was interesting what you said about the communal aspect of making the meaning of music because people can listen to music on their headphones, they can listen really in whatever context they want and make their own meaning. But that's really different than when you're there with the artist and the artist is creating a live experience with you. That's going to have a completely different meaning. Exactly. It's, it's such a, an amazing platform for exactly that, to, to give the music context. And I mean, like I said, you don't have to do that by telling stories, literally. You can do that by how the lights are designed you know mm -hmm. is it a really cozy setup with with the living room type of lighting setup or is it the edm style flashing lights you know that all of those little things tell the story and, and just mm -hmm. how you interact with the other musicians or on stage it's also a story that you're telling it's also a feeling that you're giving people and it's a context that you're giving people which um which is so important and I've, for me that's kind of what what draws me to touring is that mm. storytelling aspect yeah because it seems like that would be a completely different experience like i'm thinking of that of especially like contrasting that with say like the scoring work that you've done for shows that like that's telling a story in such a different way that i'm like that you can do right now but you can't go out and actually have like a live communal experience yeah yeah but 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 multimedia, like doing videos and stuff, is I think the way that we can do a similar thing right now. We can tell a story through music videos, or um, we can make live streams where we talk about stuff, or yeah. um, uh, we can somehow create a community around what we're doing, even though we're stuck online. Yes. <laughs> Have you been doing any scoring work lately? I know that it's so weird, like being in LA, that my friends who are working in like animation and writing have been super busy. And then my friends who work like in live action stuff are like, oh, like productions are sort of getting started. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, no, I haven't, but it's not only because of the pandemic. It's, uh, I just decided um, late last year that I would take kind of a break from that. I really wanted to concentrate on on music that was telling my own story mm -hmm. instead of telling other people's stories i felt like i had something to say and um, i just decided to back out of everything i had a few projects kind of on the horizon that i just backed out of and and, and yeah decided to fully concentrate on this album and everything surrounding that and <clears throat> there is there are some things slowly starting up now um 
there hasn't been yeah there hasn't been anything coming in even for the summer because all the productions were just halted but yeah people are finding ways you know we, we're humans we always find our ways to do <laughs> we do. we're crafty so, uh, <laughs> i think by by early next year we're gonna see more um things coming out again and i really respect that that you did take the time to focus on your own because i think that can be really difficult when you are kind of juggling multiple things um to be like well i'm gonna take this time to just focus on my story and i'm like i definitely did like a little like heck yeah face because i was just like yeah <laughs> your story is awesome it deserves to be told yeah. do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i also found found that by doing so many things it was so hard to do that properly if if half of my mind was on the TV project and the other half of, on my album, my album was not going to be what I wanted my album to be. It, it needed, it needed my full undivided attention and all my creative energy to go into it. Well, yeah, it almost sounds like there's like there's different seasons for things, and that there are some things that you know. It sounds like this was the season of making your album, and it's like, yes. all right, this is what we're doing. <laughs> like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, it's just a. I'm just not interested at the moment in, <laughs> in doing a movie or a TV show, or, but I will be again, I'm sure. Uh, oh yeah. But right, but right now, this is the story that I need to be telling. And what is that like when you immerse yourself in someone else's story? Because that seems like it would be very consuming and I would totally understand how then it would take creative energy away from your own story. Yeah, I don't do any project unless that it's fully consuming. I, I don't think I do good work unless I'm, I become all consumed by the project. <laughs> That's when you actually create good work. So if it's a story that, you know, then it's important that it's a story that you like and that you want to be completely uh, deep in for some months. But yeah, it can really take over your life. Um, and, and it can be weird because again, it's not your story. So yeah. it, can be, it can be a bit funny to, to handle the balance of that and your own life and you're also working with different time zones and you're working with people who can often be very demanding like directors or producers who, who mm -hmm. want a lot from you and um i i usually end up working the longest days when i'm working on on tv or film projects yes yes well that's interesting because in some ways like the story does have to be compelling but at least I've found with scoring work, like I sometimes like delving into other people's emotions. I find like other people's emotions and other stories to not be easier than my own story, but it's almost relaxing to kind of slip into someone else's emotional palette and be like, oh, I just have to make that emotional palette make sounds. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's much easier to hide behind someone else's ideas than to expose <laughs> the vulnerability of your own ideas. Uh, Are you <laughs> sure you can call me out like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm, I'm talking from my own experience too. Um, I find doing other people's stories to be a nice break from what happens inside my head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and it's it's in a, in a way much less vulnerable as an artist to, yes. to work with. To work with a concept or a story that you can actually place in front of you instead of exposing all of you through that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> <gasps> what kind of stories would you say compel you the most when someone presents something to you and they're like, hey, I want to score for this? What are some of the things that actually do draw you to a project? Um, in the past, it's been very personal stories, or like, and I've been drawn to kind of um stories without much flair and just about the subtleties of communication and like families or friendships and relationships mm -hmm. um but i feel that changing now and i'm I'm actually maybe it's just because i did a lot of that I, you know brought chairs and, mm -hmm. and and all these shows that i did and films that i did there they were kind of generally focused on on those things but now i feel maybe more interested in otherworldly things uh even though i haven't done much of that yet that's kind of what i imagine doing next maybe more philosophical sci-fi based stuff Ooh. i think my favorite show recently was um devs uh, oh yeah and that's that's something that shows in that style like that are kind of sci-fi but also go very deep into human nature and mm -hmm. 
and philosophical questions about the future of our relationship with technology and, and even comes down to religion at some point you know um, th those things are something that I'm very interested in in writing music for I just got really excited for like several years in the future you <laughs> yeah we'll see I'm, I'm also a bit all over the place so I can this I can want something completely different next week. <laughs> You're like, next week, it's only moss. Stories about moss, that's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> what else have you been doing in, like, in Reykjavik in general? I guess because when you said, like, things were open for a while and then they weren't and how different it is without tourists. And, like, I mean, I feel strange because, like, I'm a tourist when I'm there. And I'm like, what have you been doing not in lockdown because I have been talking to musicians who have discovered other things that they like doing but they were mostly in the U.S. and like it was very locked down or they had to leave the U.S. and go somewhere else during lockdown mm -hmm. um, but I was like did you discover anything new within your own city? Um, in, the, in the last months even though we've not been on a, on a strict lockdown or anything I've been kind of hyper focused on this album release so mm -hmm. I've been actually just working very hard <laughs> <laughs> you're like Pam I've been hiding <laughs> yeah so so I could just as well be in lockdown actually um <laughs> that's really funny um, so I, I don't know I, I I don't think I've been doing all that much outside of my studio and in my home um, I've been actually, in fact, I've been working too much and it's been affecting my health because I, mm -hmm. I, I go overboard with these things. So just last weekend, I, I bought a Nintendo Switch computer uh, so, <laughs> so I could <laughs> relax and play some video games. I haven't played video games for like 10 years and, and oh I'm just obsessed with Zelda now and that's all I want to do. <laughs> it's, it's literally what I'm thinking about now. It's like, I can't wait to go home to play more Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a new discovery for me video games i think they're wonderful they're it's really it's a they can be such a beautiful escape uh, yes. and, and a meditation in a way and i like these kind of open world games where you just roam around in a in a fictional world and just like go foraging for some berries and <laughs> fight some monsters and <laughs> casual <one does. laughs> it's, it's getting cold here now so i'm not really going outside yes. to the nature that much yes <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny that you're like well i have rediscovered that i love video games <laughs> yeah i used to love them as a teenager i played a lot of video games and, and it was always kind of a nice I, I guess it was a bit of an escape you know mm -hmm. And, and I found a lot of comfort in them as a teenager. Um, and I, I guess the same is happening now. There's a lot of stress mm -hmm. in, our, in all our lives these days. And I think video games are, um, are quite healthy for all of us right now. I think Depending on what video games, of course. I don't <laughs> think we should be getting addicted to Candy Crush, you know, or uh, I don't think that's very good for our brains. But there's a lot of beautiful video games out there that I think can just be very healthy to get lost in sometimes. Well, yeah, that escapism and that play because our brains sometimes do need a, they need a break. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Like, <sighs> that's funny. I remember as a kid falling asleep with like literally, uh, like I could almost see like the little Tetris blocks like falling under my eyelids as I was like falling asleep because I would like play on my Game Boy before bed <laughs> yeah that's been happening to me i've been i've been dreaming zelda actually uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I, I tend to play it late at night before i go to sleep so mm -hmm. that's probably not healthy actually to, to be in front of the screen so late <sighs> i'm glad that you found something to escape a bit into because you know when you said that you don't work on something unless it compels you i have a similar temperament um but it's it's important to not like go completely overboard <laughs> in that way of yeah. like doing things like yeah. play and taking care of yourself in a way. Yeah, yeah, I, I generally have a, a problem with that, uh, not going overboard with the things I do. Uh, but 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 also there's there's this big part of me that believes that going overboard is is necessary. It's the necessary difference between good and great. 
mm. like in terms of making music. Um, I can come to the studio and spend four or five hours a day here and I'll make music, I'll make an album and it'll be a good album, but it won't be great. Uh, mm. I really believe that the, the really good writing sessions, they happen when you spend like, way too much time and, you know, in the, like 16 hour days like yeah. that's when I that's when I do in my opinion great stuff because there's always this there's it just takes time to 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 get into that state of, of mm -hmm. like complete flow it takes time to shut off the outside world yeah it takes more than just a few hours it takes the whole day and it takes a lot of failed attempts and something I've really realized this year is like the moment that you're about to call it a day and go home when you're thinking like oh I've been here eight hours uh -huh. now and uh -huh. nothing much has been happening you know I've wrote, written a couple of mediocre themes and nothing great and you decide or you're thinking about okay I'm just gonna pack up and, and, and go home and I'll try again tomorrow that exact moment is the most important moment in creating stuff it's the moment where you're about to hit something great. It's it's just beyond that little fatigue moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and I I read I've read it a lot about this theory of flow state and and that theory talks about how in order to to enter flow state, which is the optimum state of your mind for being creative, um, you need to have a perfect balance of like your skill, what you can do and then um, the challenge at hand mm -hmm. so if things mm -hmm. are too easy uh, you're not going to enter that state if things are too difficult you're not going to enter it either so i think that's why this moment where you things are actually becoming difficult and you're actually about to give up that's the moment where that line is about to match up completely that x y axis of <laughs> challenge or mm -hmm. you know ability versus difficulty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's the moment where it's about to hit the right point and so i've learned a lot from that to actually stay in those moments stay for an hour more when when you really feel like going home stay for a little longer and it, like 90 percent of the time something good will happen yes yes you can't see me but, but you'll be really tired the next you'll day. be really you'll be really pooped <laughs> yeah. it's worth it but that's, you play but video that's games. what it needs you, you do need that <laughs> little overboard <laughs> uh attitude to things to to achieve something um which is above your expectations yeah because you can always then like edit it and polish it the next day but that is like where the best ideas tend to come from like i completely agree with you on that or i can do kind of like almost like edits or you know going in and making like frameworks for things in that kind of beginning four or five hours, or even like sometimes I'll spend like, I'm like, oh, I had a client day today. Like I work as a therapist as well. Usually on those days, that's when I'll set up like scaffolding for myself for songs. But I know that I'm not gonna super get into that flow state after I've already been like expending my emotional energy. So that that way on the days exactly. when I have it, then I can like build up to it, but that scaffolding is there already for me. And so then it's yeah. like really fun. Then on music days, I'm just like, ha ha. <laughs> like, we're just going to skate through this, forget to eat food. It's going to be great. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that happens to me too. That's so weird. But also eating. I've, I've learned that eating actually, it takes up so much, like, I think digestion takes up so much energy from your brain. And yes. If, if I eat too much during the day, I won't be as creative. I tend I'm to much more creative when I skip eating. So it, it, I guess what we're saying is that it's, it's making good things is going to be very unhealthy for you. <laughs> <laughs> I always joke that like people, you know, I don't know if you get this, but um, people think it's like somehow like glamorous to be a musician. And you're like, no, I'm sort of like this little feral creature poking at keyboards for the most part. Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah. 99% <laughs> like, <laughs> of the time, nothing glamorous is happening at all. Exactly. Exactly. That's so funny what you said about eating. That's why, like, I never thought I'd be the sort of person that, like, likes bubbly water. But, like, I really like carbonated water when I'm working on music because it's just, like, interesting enough that, like, I think I'm eating. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> And it fills like, up your stomach just a tiny bit more than flat water. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes, but like same thing. If <laughs> I, I this reminds me of uh, when I mixed my uh, and there was an album in 2010, so 10 years ago, uh, that I did called "And They Have Escaped the Weight of Darkness," and I mixed it with uh, 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 a mixing partner named Barry Johansson, who's from the band uh, Bang Gang, that was quite mm-hmm. popular in the late 90s, early 2000s, and we went to his house in the countryside for a week to mix the album, and I don't know why we were just in a weird mood. We decided that as a rule through this whole mixing session, we were not allowed to eat anything healthy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's some sort of an arbitrary rule that we set us. So we survived off chocolates and licorice for a week. Oh my and God. <laughs> <laughs> we were very focused and we did a lot, but then I came home and I was just sick for three days. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> a horrible idea. Oh, yeah, that's this happened so to you. funny. <laughs> oh my God. That's funny you say that. My other pod mate, he, um, he wanted to have a movie night. I was like, oh, I wonder what I could bring over to make it special. And I had my last chocolate bar actually from Reykjavik. It was one of the chocolate bars with a black licorice and sea salt. And he was uh, like... I know exactly the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, I was like, I don't know how to put it other than like, I actually really like like the petrol station brand ones better than like the really like bougie one. Um, <laughs> like, those are the ones that I hoard um, like a very normal person um, and that was what I brought and he's like what is this I was like just trust me <laughs> I was like we're gonna have a movie night we're gonna write our intentions for the month and we're gonna eat some really awesome Icelandic chocolate <laughs> like, little did you know it was like junk food chocolate from uh, last time I was at a gas station there. Um, but but those are the best. Icelanders have a very funny, funny relationship with licorice. We are, we are completely obsessed with licorice. And every yeah. time, like every foreigner who comes here, who like, we, we kind of make them go through this rite of passage. Like, what? You don't like licorice? That can't be. You have, you just haven't tried our licorice. Oh my God. That's <laughs> the conversation. We just force it to them until, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's we just force it on them until they like it, and people eventually do. I, th- I think the licorice that you have in America is kind of like medicine. We don't like that either, actually. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, that's just really. Cool. <laughs> like... yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we 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 are uh, we're very proud of our licorice traditions, and uh, we we eat a lot of it. My friend is an emergency room doctor, mm. and um, she keeps telling me how incredibly unhealthy it is to eat these kind of amounts of licorice it does something to your liver oh my and God. they get like regularly they get people in with some liver problems that are directly related with eating too much oh. licorice <laughs> she's always like there's three things in life that i won't do I, I won't go on a racer bike i won't smoke and i won't eat licorice oh. like that's her experience as an er doctor <laughs> I'm just wondering, I'm like, how much licorice must you consume to end up in the ER? Yeah, I I haven't found out yet, thankfully. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, that mixing session didn't get you there, so I'm like, small blood. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so funny. You're right, though. The licorice there, I, I was appropriately initiated at, at the gas station. Um, and uh, Maggie, aka Mighty Bear, bought like multiple kinds of like licorice and then like different candies with licorice in them so that I would have like a sample platter. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it was like... Yeah, we put licorice in everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And if you had told me, because like you said, like the licorice here is uh, kind of disgusting, frankly, to me at least. Um, sorry to all the U.S. licorice enjoyers. Um, but yeah, like if you had told me like, I'd be really down with like chocolate with licorice in it. Cause I chocolate with sea salt. I'm like, yeah, dig that sweet and salty. Yes. Excellent. Um, but the licorice adds really a cool twist to it. And so I'm glad that that's how I spent my last, my last chocolate bar. But now obviously I have to go back to Reykjavik because I'm out of chocolate. Just to get more licorice. Yeah. <laughs> Not enough to land me in the ER. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs> oh my god now i'm like i wonder if i should add that to my repertoire like bubbly water and then chocolate licorice yeah 
<laughs> it's good for creativity bubbly water and licorice that's so funny just be like yeah this is what i'm sponsored by um <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i guess it's funny in the before times i had more structures to the interviews and now i'm just like now i just get to talk to people this is chill <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is the most chill one of my day i guess what would be usually i would ask people like how do you balance things but i guess at this point like what would be your advice to people who are creating during this time because it is like you said like no one really wants to make a covid19 album um but mm. how would you advise people to kind of turn inward during this time to create um don't put too much pressure on yourself uh, to, to be creative in this time. It's, it's, uh, it's so easy to think that because we have all this time and solitude that we, that we must use the time for something. We must use it to be creative. Um, but I think that pressure we put on ourselves can be really counterintuitive. I, th I think this is, this is a time to do less. This is a time to slow down. Mm -hmm. and just reflect and um, just take some time with our thoughts and and uh, understand the situation we're in and understand our feelings about it and be in a good place about it before we try to be creative um, and that's just me talking from experience of where where i kind of burnt myself was exactly that it was it was not taking the time it was trying to work my way through this whole situation mm -hmm. and trying to to um, use my work as a distraction for it, but I really just needed to step back and take a couple of weeks and, uh, you know, allow myself to curl up in a ball and, and think the world is ending for a couple of days and then get through it and, you know, um, re be reminded that, that, you know, things are always gonna get better, things are always gonna be okay. And, and when, when you reach that point, I think you're ready to create something. I'm nodding sagely. You can't see me, but I'm nodding. <laughs> it's like those are wise words that essentially like the the only way out is like to go through it. Yeah. And then and then when when you're ready, use use the opportunity to do do the things that you just wanna do. Um we are we are experiencing the the kind of luxury of not having schedules right now mm -hmm. everything that we put in our calendars has a question mark behind it because we <laughs> never know if it's actually going to happen or not yes um as a musician normally we're used to being under time pressure because tours and, and so on are often booked in my case they're booked over a year in advance so like the tour that i'm supposed to be on now um to, to promote this album it was booked uh, and even announced before I had written a single note for the album. So there's like, oh my God. We're, we're, we're used to having this crazy time pressure on everything we do and like pressure to be creative. And, and now we don't. Now there is no schedule. Now there is, there's just question marks on everything. And, and I think that is actually an opportunity to explore what we really want to be doing um and to question what we have been doing and maybe we come to the conclusion that it's exactly what we want to be doing but maybe we come to the con conclusion that we want to change some things for mm -hmm. be before life starts up again in whatever way that will look like eventually um I, I think it's an opportunity to be just listening back to stuff that we liked when we were younger and mm -hmm. uh, remind remind ourselves why we were doing music in the first place I love that kind of like there are no rules right now. So when we all come out of this, we get to essentially craft our own. Yeah, I, I think it's a, also a wonderful opportunity for our industry to to reshape. Um, for example, with environmental causes like yes. touring industry is is it's not good for the environment. Um, and now that it's all shut down, we have an opportunity to eventually restart it in a different way and actually do things differently. Yes, yes. I spoke with the artist Aurora about that, um, mm -hmm. which was really interesting about like how to do like a, a 
like a zero, not a zero emissions tour, but like um, to offset one's carbon footprint when touring. Yeah, we were experimenting with that last year. And uh, I was really, really obsessed with trying to reduce the, the environmental impact of, of, our, of our tours. And just one example, like there's 20 people in my, in my travel party when we're mm -hmm. on the road. And let's say each of those people would drink two, three bottles of water per day. Mm -hmm. And then you have 50, 60 bottles of water every single day oh, of wow. a tour that can last for 100 days or 150 days. And if you just count all of that, like how much plastic that can be. So just the simple act of us actually buying everybody in the crew a nice reusable bottle and changing our rider to be like, we just want the clean water fountain at the venue mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. water and bottles for the crew. Just these kind of small things actually make a huge difference when it when it comes to it. But but on the other hand, we also realized that in, in the larger, like in the larger context, it was really hard to change things. Like we wanted to do more. We wanted to do mm -hmm. a lot more, but but the whole structure of the industry was so stuck in their ways that often it was just impossible, you know. Yeah. The, the, the infrastructure to do things differently just wasn't there. Um, so we couldn't do as much as we, we wanted to, but now we have an opportunity to change that actually. That's very true. And I admire that you were working on that before. Like, I'm glad that you were thinking about that because that is like, I've never been on a tour of that scale, um, but I had thought about that a lot. Even it's funny when you said about the water bottles, I was thinking about every green room I've been in generally has a bunch of water bottles and hummus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and the I'm two like, essentials of touring. Exactly. Exactly. Little do they know that we all run on um, chickpeas. But yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like now everybody knows. Um, but yeah, that there aren't like reusable things. And I was just like, that's, I'm so glad that you're thinking along those lines. And I do have hopes that, you know, when people do start touring again, it will look very different. Yeah, I, I hope so too. I, I just saw yesterday Massive Attack put out a little short film about it as well. They were trying to change some things and they just uh, posted a short film about their efforts yesterday oh, awesome. online. It was really interesting to see. And they were also talking about the same thing. Like right now is the time where we can change stuff. Right. While we're all on pause is the time where we can change the ways of yeah. doing stuff. So when we start again, they can be done differently. Well, right now is our opportunity and, and I just hope that we don't mess it up because it'll be so easy because we'll be so eager to get back when we can that we'll, we'll, the danger is there that we're just so excited to get back that we just forget about all of that. But I, I really hope that we take our time getting back and, and do it properly and do it differently. Yeah, and I think like you said about the kind of like turning in like towards yourself and being like, oh my God, everything is ending. Um, and it's almost like going through that little like mini spiritual crisis um, and then coming out the other side. And I don't think people are going to forget that. Like, I don't know what action they'll take on it. I think that some people might want to deny it, but I think that that experience will stay with us. Um, and I'm hopeful that people will take <laughs> purposeful action, I guess is how I'd put it, where it's like, oh, that experience you had, instead of trying to bury that because it was painful, why don't you use that to actually create change and to do things a different way? Because otherwise, then I have the distinct feeling we would just lead ourselves directly into another one of those existential tailspins. Exactly. <laughs> this this pandemic happened for a reason. You know, it it it, it kind of hurts to to think about it, but this pandemic essentially is here because of the way we treat animals, the way we our meat industry works. The way, you know, the, we will be in this situation again if we don't change our ways. So we have to do, do things differently when we come back. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with that, like across the board of the industries you mentioned and many more, that it's just like, yeah, it doesn't seem like we were on the right track because look what happened. Yeah. Yeah. This is a man-made thing, you know, and I don't mean that in the conspiracy way. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> You're like, I mean that in the how we've treated the planet we ended up on way, not in like the, the yeah. creepy people shipping children in furniture way. Um, yeah. and, and there's <laughs> other other bigger crises that we all already see on the horizon, like with, with climate change. Yes. Um, yes. yes. And this, if anything, this should be a reminder that we need to change our ways. Yes. So to act with purpose and to go within and to create right. from that place instead of haphazardly. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. This has been such a pleasure getting to talk to you. Yeah, for me too. Thank you so much for having me on your on your podcast. <laughs> I was like, I have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again for listening to this episode of Why Not Both. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform. You can also come hang out with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, both on Instagram and on Twitter. This season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar magazine. Under the Radar is a nationally distributed print, music, and entertainment magazine and website. You can find them at www.undertheradarmag.com and feel free to support them on Patreon. Extra special thanks to our producer, Laura Studeris, who is literally a rock star. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you next episode. Thank <laughs> you.